muted still okay now i'm not muted <laughs> Oh my lord. Okay, you're you you know it's gonna be a great stream when I'm like from the get-go, I'm I'm just muted. <laughs> a great start. The best uh, the best intro. Good thing because I fucked it up anyway. So hi uh, and welcome to this week's True Crime live stream. I'm Fear Sona, you can call me Fear, Red or Sona, and I'm your friendly friendly neighborhood true crime VTuber. Here to give you full body chills and here to fuck up my intro, as always. Also, what I was saying before, um, I was rudely interrupted by my microphone not working and um, my streaming, you know, um, software not working or not allowing me to speak. <laughs> Great start, Fear. Thank you, thank you. Why, thank you. Okay, so, before I was so rudely interrupted by... Um, you know, rebellious uh, streaming software and microphone. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, I just want you guys to um, understand and get a gra like grasp the nature of the situation and the nature of this stream and like what what you are about to witness because I'm back in Taiwan. I came back on Tuesday, and I'm currently in quarantine at a at a hotel. Um, jet lag is definitely not my friend, so, um, I'm slowly spiraling, spiraling down the black hole of jet lag. And just so you know, I have not- last time I slept was, like, yesterday at 4 p.m. my time, which means it's been almost 24 hours for me to not sleep. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be an experience. Uh, the- this is gonna be- <laughs> A true experience. I don't know if I can go through this case. I have no idea if I can even like talk about this case because I'm gonna be talking about the case in English and then there are names in Polish which is my native mother tongue not na well native language mother tongue and I don't think I can mix those two today. You can you can tell by the way you can tell by the by the way I'm speaking right now but by how I'm speaking right now, I'm trying very, very hard to pronounce words correctly and pronounce, you know, English correctly, as correctly as I can. Um, but yeah, um, this is gonna be a true wild ride. And uh, yeah, I might, I might fall asleep. Honestly, I might fall asleep somewhere, you know, in the middle of this stream. So just so you guys know. On this base. <laughs> Oh man, wait, Sona, has your brain still finished the flight back? No, not really. I don't think so. I'm I think I'm still somewhere like over Turkey or you know, I, I don't even know. Polish only stream when? <laughs> Possibly today if I cannot handle you know, kind of speaking about the case in English and then just pronouncing Polish names. Very 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 possible that I'm just gonna switch to I'm just gonna be done with this BS. Also, fun fact, the the list of creatures that are dicks is getting longer because now I just, while I couldn't sleep, I was, uh, I was just, you know, watching random videos on YouTube and I made it to a video about Australian magpies and um, those birds are dickity dicks of dicks. <laughs> like, I have to say that they made it to number one. Like, they made it to number one of this list. Like, I've, I, yeah, I, I, I said what I said. Okay. Okay, Sona, we all understand. <laughs> hey, Sona, guess what? What? What happened? Wait, let me just take a sip of my, of my, uh, drink, because, like, holy shit. Oh no, I didn't brush up on my Polish. I don't think anyone brushed up on their Polish. I don't think Polish people just brushed up on their Polish. Um. Okay, so. <laughs> true. Yep, true. Australian magpies. Fuck you in particular, magpies from Australia. <laughs> Man. <laughs> they, are, they are like truly... I don't know. Like, this was, this was the theme of my... Of, of me being up this, you know, last night. I was just watching videos of magpies in Australia attacking people. And it was it was a true highlight of, of the night. Okay, but, uh, you know, aside from magpies, uh, we can talk about 
today's case and uh, let me, without further ado, let me move. Um, wait, what was I, what was I supposed to say? Let me switch to my murder board and let's get right into it. Yes, truly great start. So now you sound really happy. I sound ecstatic. I sound like I didn't sleep for like 50 years and I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm older. I think after last night, I'm like older by 10 years. <laughs> Wait, also I have to like, what am I doing? Man, okay. Okay, so let's move on to today's case and a friendly reminder that um, the content that I'm about to talk about does um, include graphic description of violence, strong language, and, um, you know, obviously sensitive content. So if you are um, not really, like, if you don't handle this kind of content well, please click away. You've been warned. Viewer discretion, discretion is advised. God damn, I cannot speak. Okay, so it's always hard to listen or talk about the cases with a series of murders where multiple lives were ended prematurely, taken by someone who had no right to take them to begin with. And the case I have for you today is especially sad because the killer targeted people who are already being heavily prejudiced against in Poland. And so their lives were difficult to begin with in the late, in the late um, 1980s and early 1990s, and they are still difficult today. Between 1988 and 1993, in the span of five years, seven young homosexual men were murdered. Well, I mean, middle-aged. Okay, is for okay, 40 to 60. The you know, the year, the age span of 40 to 60. Is that young? I think it's young. To to me today, it's like everyone is forever young. Okay. Anyway, so between 1988 and 1993, um. Seven homosexual men were murdered in their own apartments under the guise of a casual sexual intercourse with the killer. The absolutely infuriating, disgusting, and horribly sad part is that the deaths of gay men in Poland during that time just didn't seem to spark the feeling of urgency within the law enforcement. Um, or rather, it just seemed that the witnesses... Um, and investigators walked into this case with a certain misguided idea about the victims already, you know, painted in their heads. Not to mention that because of the general prejudice against, you know, homose homosexual people in Poland, the community was very much unwilling and even scared to speak with the law enforcement to begin with. And it's the same now. Like, I mean, it's not the same now. Like, obviously... Times are changing, attitudes are definitely changing in Poland, but it's still a very much an issue. Like, it's still a huge issue, like the prejudice against LGBTQ um, plus people. Which, by the way, like I, you know, I've witnessed myself, I've somewhat experienced myself because as a bisexual person, like I, you know, and Polish person, like I've I've just seen, I've just spoken to people who did not understand what bisexuality is and they were just, they had just a lot of, you know, incorrect assumptions and definitely a lot of, there's a lot of incorrect assumptions about homosexual people in Poland. As always, I'm going to try my best to give you a bit of a background of each um, of the victims because I consider it extremely important to remember that those are not just empty names on the killer's hit list. These were real people that had real lives and were so, so much more than and far beyond what happened than what happened to them. Poland go brrr. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, believe me, like I, I cannot believe that this is, it's 2022 and some things are still happening and some ideas very wrong ideas about lgbtq community is you know are still there okay so this is the unsolved mystery of the Wuch gay murders and yes this name this horrific name um of the city is called is pronounced as Wuch. okay so 
which is um, the third largest city in Poland. Let me just... I know, what do I do? Okay. So, which is the third largest city in Poland located in the central part of the country? Um, and it's also the capital of Łódź uh, Voivodeship. Um, it is known as the former industrial center um, of Poland with the current population of nearly 700,000 people. It is a big city like, you know, any other big city. Um, it has better and worse er areas uh, with places that are not the safest, which is just, you know, you know, it, it's just a regular thing for a large city. There are nice areas um, and there are also those like shady areas where, you know, it's not exactly safe. But in today's story, the victims did not wander to some shady, darkest alleys of the city. On the contrary, they were seen in the most popular, uh, one would think, friendly areas for homosexual people. And then they died in their own homes, adding up to seven murders between um, late 1980s and early 1990s. So we move on to the first victim, 37-year-old Stefan. Um, and mind you, like in this case, only one full name is known. Um, one full name of the victim is known. The rest of the victims, you know, the the full names were never really, they were never shown to the public. So I will just go by their first names. So 37-year-old Stefan did not have an easy life. He was recently divorced um, because he couldn't hide his true sexuality, he, his true self from his ex-wife and lie to her about himself any longer. He just wanted to be true to himself and live the best way he could. But that also proved to be easier said than done. Lack of a stable job uh, forced him to take on you know, several odd jobs at first, and then try his luck in a um, seasonal job in Austria. So he would just, you know, go to Austria for a couple of months a year and then come back. Um, and it was hard, like, it was mostly hard labor. His experience as a homosexual man in Poland, um, the lack of acceptance and eventually hostility from his neighbors um, and, you know, people around him caused him to seek professional help at the mental health center, but his struggle was just too big to handle um, both his mental state and his uh, life responsibilities. And so Stefan ended up going on um, the so-called sickness absence. I guess that's how you translate it in Polish, but um, I think it's it might be closer to um, disability pension, even though he wasn't like full time on disability pension. His neighbors later testified that somewhere around that time, Stefan started hosting loud parties um, at his apartment, and there wasn't a day without loud music, screams, and tons of drunk people spilling in and out of his place. Stefan would invite men over, mostly, uh, which only stirred the pot of rumors and disgust with, um, you know, with him further in, in the community and in, in his building. Because people simply didn't understand and they just, again, it's like this misguided kind of, um, obviously like loud parties are not great anywhere. Like if you're having constant loud parties in, a, in a, an apartment building that no one's gonna like you, like everyone's gonna hate you. But on top of it, like the neighbors would just assume that Stefan would have like some kind of orgies and, you know, it was like very bad stuff was happening at those parties, even though it was like mostly just hangouts and just, yeah, like just loud parties. <laughs> Again, let's move on from the name of the city. Yeah, it's, it's Wuj, okay, it's, it's weird. So some of the neighbors would say, or like at least one neighbor uh, said, quote, people would come and go out of that place. Someone was always there partying. Which, I mean, you know, that's that's exactly what I described, you know. It was just just like that. It was a, just a constant party. And it might have been because Stefan felt, felt just lonely. He, um, you know, he was struggling with his mental health. He was trying his best, but he just needed company. He just needed someone that understood him um, 
and you know he could find it within the gay community oh sorry um but one day the parties stopped the music no longer played a neighbor noticed that the, the apartment was unusually silent and there was no sight of Stefan that day or for several days. On June 27th, 1988, the neighbor noticed that the odor, like, sorry, that, that the door to Stefan, great, odor. Um, good job. Good job me, like, you know, checking my notes. Um, so the neighbor noticed that the door to Stefan's apartment was slightly ajar, but the owner was not coming outside and Stefan was nowhere near um, you know nowhere inside of the building so concerned the neighbor called for another neighbor to come over with her and check on Stefan check check the apartment when they walked into the apartment they witnessed a horrifying scene Stefan's bloody corpse was just sprawled on the floor still fully dressed but his legs were tied with an electrical cord and there were several multiple stab wounds in his chest or to his chest and arms. When the police investigated the scene, they found the alleged murder weapon, a kitchen knife. And yet later, the autopsy report concluded that Stefan actually died um, from strangulation with the cord first and then was stabbed afterwards. The coroner determined that by the time the body was found, Stefan was dead for several days and likely died on around June 19th, um, 1988. Hey, my birthday, but not 1988. In not a good thing. Not a good, not a good moment to like mention that it's my birthday and someone died on the same day. Well, I mean, not the same day, but like June 19th. <clears throat> good job. Patting myself on the back here. No, please don't. Stop it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, wait, let me just read some of the chats. Uh, Pancho Villa says, Were cops homophobic in Poland back then? I remember a case in the USA where the cop didn't pay attention because the victim was gay. I would say so. Like, obviously, I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't alive in the 1980s yet. I didn't exist. Um, but from what I can tell and, like, what stories I hear there was definitely prejudice with prejudice within the law enforcement like against um my goodness someone like oh my god there's like police passing by i don't know if you can if you guys can hear it but there are like sirens next to the hotel um so as i said there was definitely some prejudice um you know within the law enforcement within just general polish society which is heavily christian heavily catholic um, and they, I don't, I'm not saying that the church is bad. Um, I'm just saying like the church in Poland is very misguided. Like at least the church in Poland is like presenting a very misguided and it was presenting a very misguided and very incorrect, um, idea of the homosexual people of LGBTQ and they still do it. Um, which means, you know, like people would just take this knowledge from the church and they would just take this hate from the church and they would just pass it on and that's how it was you know like it was pretty dangerous for like for a lot of people a lot of gay people it was it was very dangerous to even like come out even today it's sometimes scary to walk down the street with like holding hands um i mean not saying it's like super dangerous every time i'm just saying like in some places in Poland, I would say it's, you know, you, you will encounter those kind of people. Has the church ever been pro-gay? No, no, not really. But I'm, I'm just saying, like, the church isn't imminently evil. Um, I'm just saying in, in Poland, the, you know, the, the church as an entity or the church as an organization, like, it's very political and very, very unfair and very not um, tolerant towards some groups so definitely I'm not applying that to you know the Catholic Church as a whole I know that there are definitely some good people and there are definitely some good Catholic people some good Christian people um but I'm just saying like in Poland it's it's you know the the church is pretty toxic 
and it was just driving people like there, it was just like a constant constant um i don't know how to describe it like a endless cycle of like the church just kind of spinning the wheels of hatred and yet some people still think that the times were better when the church was making the rules <laughs> yeah no <laughs> yeah no <laughs> oh my lord that was it was terrible times <laughs> the church had like literal literal army and there were crusades and there was just like oh my god there was like forceful indoctrination no just no <laughs> okay let me just take a sip of my water because my uh my throat is is just dying eastern europe soviet soviet era didn't help oh definitely not oh it was, it was terrible it was like the epitome of you know just being prejudiced against like people for existing like in poland yeah like polish people were were just being prejudiced against and and then polish people were like being prejudiced against prejudiced against something they i don't know it was just like an end endless cycle very intense okay so as i said um sorry so as i said stefan did not die from the stab wounds he actually died from strangulation and again as i said like he would be dead for several days he died on june 19th he was found on june 27th and investigators interviewed hundreds of people so they did actually take on this case um they would interview people who frequented the place um and stefan's parties but ultimately did not find the suspect and the case quickly kind of went cold i don't know i'm not sure like how quickly they dropped it it's not it's never really stated like how quickly they dropped um stefan's case or like kind of pushed it aside um but yeah like it wasn't as intense of an investigation as as you would like expect because it was a brutal murder and then we move on to the next victim the next one was jacek so jacek could be called the complete opposite of stefan he led a very stable and happy life um, with a wide circle of connections and friends and surrounded by family uh, Jacek worked as um, a PTTK guide uh, which actually PTTK stands for Polish or I mean this is the the Polish name but um the English translation is Polish Tourist and Sightseeing Society um, and it is a Polish non-government tourist organization with um, 312 branches across the country and one of the oldest organizations such or this type of organizations in Europe so you know he had a very good job he had a very stable you know like very well paid job and on July 30th 1989 so that's a year after um, the murder of Stefan Jacek attended a regular event for gay people in Łódź. So this was like called Piketa, um, which could be translated as demonstration, but it was more of a social event, social gathering than an actual political demonstration for um, gay people in Łódź. And it, they would usually like gather in, at sorry, gather at uh, Łódź Fabryczna station. Um, and again, it wasn't um, as much of a political demonstration as it was like just a social gathering and it was also a, usually a great opportunity for people to meet up and maybe find a partner find friends you know just connect and um you know comfort each other because it was a very difficult time it was a difficult situation for them um so you know everyone needed someone to have that support and that day Jacek met someone at the event and he brought that person home. Again, the neighbors noticed that Jacek hasn't really come out of his apartment for several days after he came back from, from the event. What also changed was the smell because it was spreading throughout the building and it was foul. It was just a terrible, terrible odor coming from the floor where Jacek's apartment was located. and. As you may know, I mean, you probably know if, you know, in any true crime case, if there is any mention about foul odor, 
spreading in the building, that's, you know, that means something. And um, it doesn't mean, you know, it means something very bad. Eventually, neighbors found someone with a spare key to uh, Jacek's apartment. And this part was very unclear if this person was another resident or the building's supervisor. But someone had a spare key to this apartment. And then they opened the place on August 4th. Again, the scene was hard to look at. Jacek's lifeless body was tied up with rope and a belt, a cloth sticking out of his mouth. The autopsy determined that he, too, just like Stefan, died from strangulation. Someone literally shoved the cloth down his throat and waited for the 40-year-old man to suffocate. And it turns out that this time, the perpetrator also robbed the victim's apartment. He took, or this person took, several valuable um, items like the TV, a VHS, and just some smaller valuables. And the police again questions dozens of people, but the case is shoved to the side when they, do when they don't find any, you know, plausible leads any, you know, any very solid leads. So again, it's, you know, it just kind of shoved to the side and they are not connecting, like, by this time, they are not connecting the two cases. They're just like, okay, I mean, you know, like another, another day in Wuj, whatever. Some Febreze, maybe. <laughs> okay, so it didn't take long for the killer to strike again, and this time only several months after the previous victim, so after Jacek. And it was this case that left the most evidence and finally pushed the police to see that the murders were connected. 50-year-old Bogdan Juszczyk. This is the only, by the way, this is the only victim that I have um, the full name for. Uh, because Bogdan Juszczyk was a passionate actor and... I'm sorry, actor, who worked and performed at several theaters in Łódź and as well as some, he would get some film parts in his resume, so he did have a career, established career in acting. Uh, he was in love with acting, acting from an early age and eventually went on to study acting at the National Academy of Dramatic Arts in Warsaw, uh, which he, which he gradua graduated from in 1960. Oh my lord, I cannot speak. Even though he never became a maybe a huge celebrity, um, he loved his work and his life, which was basically cut short on November 22nd, 1989. And uh, wait, let me just say some hello to some people. Wait, oh, I, I see Nicholas. Sorry, I didn't notice you before. Hi. And I see Aaron. Hi. Uh, some of that 90p CCTV camera quality. Oh, yeah. Hey, been a minute since I saw your stream. Been working a lot. Oh, don't, don't worry, Kaibi. Uh, or KB? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. But uh, hi, thank you so much for tuning in. So, back to the story. That day, he attended a party. Sorry, Bogdan actually attended a party uh, at a friend's house when he eventually left the gathering... Um, with another friend, they, the both of them headed towards the nearby bus stop. And there they met another man, an unknown man, and immediately Bogdan, Bogdan was attracted to this man, which this person seemed to reciprocate. Bogdan said goodbye to his friend and left the bus stop with the mysterious stranger taking him to his, back to his apartment on Wanova Street. A few hours later, Bogdan make, uh, made a call to his friend and told him all about the mystery man and that everything was just the way he had hoped. Um, so everything was going great, you know, like this man was great, they were attracted to each other, they were having a great time, all was good. However, when the friend called again sometime later, Bogdan did not pick up, no matter how many times the, the friend tried to call him. And when the police got called to Bogdan's apartment, because the friend actually came over and he was trying to 
you know, obviously like knock, um, just to check in on his friend. And then eventually he called um, the police. So when police officers arrived to at Bogdan's apartment, they found him stabbed to death. So yet another victim stabbed. And this time, wait, let me just switch this off. So this time the police did gather enough, you know, evidence and enough description because they had a witness. So Bogdan's friend who gave them all the details about the mysterious guy. Um, oh, wait. Oh my God. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for your donation. Uh, Noza memes. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. Just discovered your channel not too long ago. Pretty good content. Thanks for these streams. Hey, no problem. And uh, thank you so, so much for your donation. It's it, wow. Okay. It's very generous of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm sorry if I really sound like not I, if I don't sound like super excited, I'm just like, I'm just trying to stay awake. So again, this time the police had a witness because Bogdan's friend saw the mystery man that Bogdan took home that day. And, you know, he gave um, the investigators a very detailed uh, description of this man and that helped them make a um, composite sketch of the suspect. The police by now connected Bogdan's murder to the other two and concluded that this may be the work of the same person or organized group of young men who whose strategy is to get to the into the victim's apartment um, under the pretext of, you know, having a sexual intercourse with them and then attack them and rob um, their belongings, basically rob their apartment. Despite having the suspect's portrait, um, and having interviewed over 70 witnesses in this case alone, so in Bogdan's case, again, no hard leads came forth. The serial killer was still out there, waiting to strike again. And he did. Because on February 25th, 1990, a friend came over to visit 41-year-old Andre who lived alone on Gwatka Street in Łódź, so the same city. When Andrzej fi finally opened the door, or rather just slightly cracked it, he actually told his friend, quote, you know, I'm not alone, end quote. And then through that cracked door, so he didn't even open the door fully for his friend, but he would proceed to tell his friend that he happened to stop by um, another gathering at Łódź Fabryczna station, so the same kind of event for, for gay people. Um, and he picked up a guy there. And just like some of the previous victims, he would bring the guy home. The friend said, okay, hey, no problem. Um, you guys have fun. I'm gonna leave. So the friend left. And the thing about Andrzej was that he had schizophrenia which actually required him to visit his local psychiatric um, clinic or mental health clinic every day to receive medication. That was like, remember, that was back in the 1990s or 19... Wait, was it? Yeah, that was 1990. I guess it wasn't possible to get like advanced prescription for... Or there were like some required like daily checkups for uh, schizophrenic people. Um but basically, that's that's how, um, you know, Andre did it. Like, he had to um, get to an appointment at his um, psychiatric hospital um, or at, a, at the psychiatrist. And he was always on time to pick up his prescription and to meet his doctor. So there was never a day he would... There was never a day that he would be absent without notice. Like, he would always make it. But when on March 5th, he didn't show up to the clinic. One of the nurses who worked at the clinic, concerned concerned about um, Andre's well-being, decided to check on him and went to his apartment. She knocked, rang the bell, but no one was answering the door. So she tried the doorknob. Lo and behold, the door was actually opened. And then the nurse found Andre dead on the floor. Again, same thing, Andre was stabbed 
several times with a knife. And he was definitely dead. It took several lives to be cut short for the authorities to start treating the homicides as the work of a serial killer and from and form a special unit to find the killer this particular in this particular case who targeted gay men in Wuch. Uh, okay, let me just read some of the chats. Uh, Jacob, the difficult thing about schizophrenia is it, it is it causes people to forget they have it, so you don't take your meds and falling uh, off can cause a serious problem. Yeah, like I don't have, you know, the whole understanding of how schizophrenia works. I just know, like in this story, it just seems like Andre was very like, solid about his taking his meds like he was very consistent he he would always like make it to his appointment like there wasn't any problems up until this time that's why that's why when he didn't show up like it was very very suspicious and that's why like the nurse just immediately go went to check on him uh kevin so there are many uh, there are many types of killers that have their own targets they target men, women, children, gays, lesbians, prostitutes, couples, celebrities, and even serial killers. I mean, I suppose so. I don't know if I have heard about like a serial killer targeting another serial killer. Like I would have to dig for that one. But um, but definitely, I mean, I assume so. There, you know, unfortunately, there are serial killers for. It's gonna sound bad, but there's a serial killer killer for everyone out there. <laughs> Which, oh my god, this is this sounded so bad. I'm sorry, I, I haven't slept in like 24 hours. Forgive me. Uh, 27 stab wounds. I thought it was 28. Nice reference. <laughs> I'm still not sure about how... Uh, okay, it is to crack, to crack jokes when talking about murder victims don't want to upset anyone. Well, I mean, I'm not cracking jokes about the murder victims. I'm just more like laughing at myself and... Um, you know, laughing at the kind of um, ridiculous approach of the police and like how obviously like I'm not laughing about like schizophrenia like I'm just saying like he was very consistent and that you know that they um, and also I don't have the whole grasp of schizophrenia I, I am not laughing about like you know mental con condition of anyone okay serial killer on serial killer what is what is this Dexter what is this Dexter well, I mean, again, I'm just saying, like, yeah, there's there's a possibility that this kind of person exists. It's very unfortunate. And it's to begin with, it's, like, very bad that serial killers exist, you know, in the first place. Um, then you need to sleep if you haven't slept for 24 hours. Sleeping is important, Sona. I know, I know. I mean, me cracking the jokes. Oh! <laughs> well, I mean... See, as far as long as we don't, I don't think it's bad. Like, I think it's fine to interject a bit of a dark humor into the case as long as we're not disrespecting the victims. I personally, this is, you know, this whole thing, like my whole channel is about, yes, about true crime, but it's also entertainment in a way. It is dark humor. So it's gonna be, there's gonna be jokes. If you're not comfortable with that, obviously it's completely fine. That's okay. You don't have to be. And, um, you know, I completely understand if it's not the format for you. And I absolutely encourage you to uh, look up the cases, like articles about the cases. You don't have to um, listen if, you know, if you if you feel like the format is this kind of dark humor format is not for you. But yeah, like I I always try to be respectful for the towards the victims, um, the families. And I only, you know, if if anything, I just crack jokes about yeah like the yeah like the killer or something or or the ridiculousness of the work of the police or what they missed or whatever yeah i agree okay i mean yeah vtuber serial killer <laughs> it's <laughs> i mean <laughs> i yeah i don't i don't know how to respond to that like i i am not <laughs> i swear to god i am not I'm, I'm good. I'm just sitting in my room. What am I supposed to like? What, what else can I do? Okay. As long as it's not really mean-spirited, I think that's okay. But that's just me. Um, yeah, I think some people, you know, like I understand when some people have a problem with that. Because there are people like that, you know, like... And it's fine. Again, it's fine. You know, there are people who just prefer 
more serious approach or like you know completely like serious documentaries and serious uh podcasts about true crime i just i just like to inter interject some dark humor i'm seeing a pattern attends parties gay gatherings goes to uh what the victim's home and then does the crime sorry cut off it's okay yeah yeah that's you know by now it, there was definitely a very distinct pattern you know the method of murder was like either strangulation or stabbing the victim and it was you know that what led to the murder was very very similar so yeah parties gay parties or gatherings just social gatherings heavy heavy drinking coming back home to um for a one night stand and then just you know it ends up in a murder okay so as i said by this time the police in Wuj actually formed a special unit to find the killer. Um, and after, sorry, after Andre's homicide, the police managed to interview 269 witnesses from the gay community, including several crooks or, you know, several bad apples who were known to rob their sexual partners. So that was, you know, that's what they were doing. They were murdering people, but they did rob people. And yet, no one knew who this guy was, who the suspect was. Also, I'm sorry, but my nose is, like, freaking leaking. Jesus. Ah! Apologies. Okay. And the killer was getting ballsy. Wait, that sounded bad. I'm sorry. That's not... <laughs> that's not what I meant. That sounded bad. So, the you know the killer was 69 jesus so the killer you know moved on to another victim on or in july of 1990 41 year old businessman jakob m um lived together with his parents at the time one night he brought an unknown man back home from a party and they had a few drinks likely followed by a sexual intercourse. Afterwards, Jakob decided to give his date a ride home. Um, also, do not drunk driving, i just saying. And this was the last time Jakob was seen alive, and his body- this is the only victim that was not murdered at his home. Mostly, I mean, I assume because his parents were there, um, but his body was found on the same day, July 31st, um, 1990, discard, like basically discarded um, at the edge of a forest near a town called uh, Głowno. Also, not far from his house, so it was very close to the, the house, but obviously like it was outside, Jakub was strangled with bare hands. So someone just, you know, used their hands, the perpetrator used their hands and strangled him. Um, and the car was also found abandoned nearby. The police was hopeful for more evidence this time because, you know, after all, Jakub and his victim, or sorry, Jakub and his, not victim, his killer, um, had a party right before the murder and they also had a intercourse. Um, the perpetrator had to have left something, anything worth investigating, um, you know, on the, at the scene. Unfortunately, right after Jakub left with the guest, his mother cleaned the place up, so there was nothing left. And um, I mean, obviously, she couldn't she couldn't have assumed um, that something bad is gonna happen. But like, goddamn woman, don't don't clean right away. Um, but yeah, like you know, she wiped the place clean. There was nothing. And the next one to fall a victim to the killer was 48 years old Jan D. And he was an owner of a fish and seafood, um, small fish and seafood restaurant, uh, which he often advertised in the local newspaper or put up a help wanted type of an ad. Um, he would often look for young men for seasonal work at his store and even offered them accommodation at his home at his own house which by the way now that i'm like kind of going through the story and i'm thinking about it it's it's pretty 
I don't want to say creepy, but it's kind of creepy. Like if you're, if yeah, like if you're hiring and it's just like, oh, you're only hiring young men, and then you also put an annotation that, oh, and and I also, you know, you can stay at my house. I would be like, maybe not. But hey, but it's again, it's like maybe different mentality. It was like 1990s. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm just not. Um, completely understanding the mentality back in the day. On the 20th of February 1992, uh, his body was, so Jan's body was discovered in his house, tied up, um, and Jan sustained, sustained several wounds from blunt force trauma. So this time it's like diff another um, murder method. This time the killer just basically beat Jan to death. Um, the police talked to Jan's family and friends and managed to gather a description of an unknown man uh, who was recently seen at Jan's place. And this description matched the, the sketch of the serial killer that the police already had from Bogdan's case, so back a few, year, a few years back. So the last known and oldest victim of the gay murderer was 62-year-old Kazimierz K. He was retired at the time of his death, and it is known that he would often join the gay event at Wojtfabryczna station. Um, it was his friend Paweł who would often get him to come out of his shell and, you know, go to those kind of events with him because Kazimierz was not, you know, like he was a little older. He was just like, um, I don't know. Um, he wasn't exactly like, exactly like super social, and it was actually Pavel who who would first strike up a, a conversation with a mysterious guy at the event. Uh, the two of them would go to Pavel's house, but Pavel didn't. So Pavel is a friend of Kazimierz, uh, the friend of the last victim. Um, Pavel didn't really want the guy to stay over. Um, for the sake of being careful, for the sake of being safe, you know, Pavel was just like, no, you know, I don't know this person, um, I don't want them to stay over. So Pavel just offered to um, meet the guy, meet up with the guy again um, at the same event the next day, to which he brought Kazimierz uh, this time. Then the three of them would go back to the apartment where Kazimierz lived, lived. so... Um, Soon, the small hangout turned into a full-on party uh, when other people joined. So it was just it just started with the three of them, but then they in invited other people. Um, and after a while, the party moved to another place to join a friend's party. So, so just merge into another party uh, where they drank heavily, drank like alcohol until very very late. And Kazimierz ended up ended up inviting the guy back to his place. Okay, uh, let me just read some of the chats because I'm, I'm kind of missing all of the messages. Kazim sleep. No, it's Kazimierz. Kazimierz. It's a, it's a pretty common... Well, I mean, it's a common name in Poland, but it's um, pretty old school, so I don't think... It's not popular now. Like, no one, no one really names their child Kazimierz now. I don't think so. Um, have the police found any DNA? Maybe f maybe blood from the killer. Stabbing isn't easy and I expect to cut yourself um, sometimes during the murders. It doesn't seem so because um, it's also 1990s and it's Poland. Um, DNA testing wasn't really advanced back then. Like it wasn't really, it wouldn't really tell you much. Like it was, it was, mo it would mostly, yeah, like it was, it wouldn't tell you like who who it was. It wouldn't give you a name. It would tell you that, oh, you know, is it a woman? Is it a man? Um, and does it match the other DNA? Like, is it the same DNA? Um, but it doesn't seem like they tested at the time. Um, but because, yeah, like again, or maybe they did. I, I just don't have the information about like whether they, they might have gathered the DNA, but I don't have the information if they tested it. So, I don't think they did. Uh, if the killer only killed gays after coming to their place, does that mean there's any sexual kind of DNA evidence? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Like, um, I couldn't really answer that. Um, from what I can, like, what I 
was reading about like they just mentioned oh you know there was likely a sexual intercourse but they don't mention anything about the dna so i'm just like uh okay did did you really test did you not test um but yeah like that's you know they did have information that it was a man that you know the victims were homosexual men that the victim likely homosexual men that the victims were meet, meeting at the event so i guess that's as far as they could even like get like as much information that as they could get from the dna and just like if it matched back then it needed a big sample yeah like if if you wanted to get more information i suppose like you back in the day like 1980s 1990s you needed a a lot of material and it just doesn't seem like there was anything significant okay so as i said on that day uh, Kazimierz ended up, you know, getting, bringing the guy over or back to his place. And the following day, on July 12th, 1993, Pavel tried calling, calling his friend, but, you know, Kazimierz didn't pick up. So, Pavel drives over to his friend's place, but again, no response. Finally, he would break the door open, because he was banging on the door, he was trying to get in, you know, it was closed, it was locked, so he just broke the, do the door open and found Kazimierz strangled to death. So again, this is the last victim, that's how he found him. And the investigation um, of several homicides of gay men was not easy for the authorities, and not because of prejudice, well, I mean, yes, because of prejudice from the justice system, from the law enforcement, but not directly, at least. Again, I mentioned it at the beginning, but gay community in Łódź, or in general, and gay community in Poland... Sorry, that was like a doorbell. I think they brought my... <laughs> I think they brought my lunch. They were not supposed to ring. Sorry. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so... As I said, the gay community in Poland back in the 1980s and 1990s um, was rather closed off to the outsiders. Um, this was in a way to protect themselves from the hate from the society, which was not uncommon during that time. Uh, people actually feared or hated what they didn't understand. And they still, you know, they still do today. Um, you know, like that there, there are a lot of people who just don't understand what LGBTQ is. Um, and they just, for some reason, they hate it because they heard something that's, you know, they, they didn't like. But uh, that also meant that people in the community were not very willing to speak with the law enforcement. There were cases of gay people getting outed by or attacked by police officers, like straight up um, attacked by the police officers. So who's to say this wasn't just a, you know, kind of like a provocation to shame them and attack the community again? Um... So again, it was like hard to get the witnesses to speak. Okay. Uh, wait. Andover, Kansas was just slammed by a tornado. What? Okay. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Ring, ring, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. Yeah, they brought me lunch and I just, I told the front desk not to like, ah, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, that, there was a, there was a ring. Uh, so this killer either stabs or strangles his victims, sometimes does both. It shows he has a clear rage and hatred towards them. These types of murders are very personal. How tragic. And I'm gonna explain it, like, I'm gonna, you know, dive a little bit into the killer's profile and, you know, the possible suspect in a second. So experts analyzing all seven murders theorized, actually, like, what you just said, uh, theorize that the attacker, uh, while also likely homosexual, um, he very possibly, like, it. it's pretty clear that he hates his sexual orientation, or possibly hates his sexual orientation, or could have been abused by another homosexual person, and thus is directing his hurt and rage on towards other, hom other homosexual people, and it's just like, he's just discharging that rage onto you know, other gay people. Despite the fact that the perpetrator was seen around the victim or even 
seen leaving the victim's apartment um, and the police had his description um, and several sketches of the suspect, they couldn't find the guy. So it's still, you know, it's very, it's still unknown or it was unknown. Okay, so moving on. Until they came across a lead, a pretty solid lead, sometime in 1993 after the last murder. A witness who remained anonymous said that he had a sexual intercourse with a young man by the name Roman. Uh, wait. Scholastica just, uh, <laughs> just donated. Thank you so much for your donation. Uh, sirens, lunch bells, the fierce on the lore is getting wild. <laughs> the blood thickens. <laughs> sirens, the, the, the bells, my funeral, I think my funeral bells. <laughs> I think that's, that's it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pass out at my, my laptop. But we're almost done. So, again, this witness who remained anonymous, um, you know, testified that he actually had a sexual intercourse with a young man by the name Roman, or in Polish, just Roman. Roman. Uh, he would tell the police that he met up with Roman um, the following day, and together they went over to the last victim's apartment on the day when Kazimierz is be believed to have been murdered. So that day when he had the party, which was like ele July 11th and then um, July 12th, the witness said that they partied for a while and then he left the place, um, leaving Roman and Kazimierz alone. And the next day, Kazimierz was found dead in his apartment. So, you know, to this witness, the last person to be with Kazimierz was Roman. The witness added that when he was walking Roman home the previous day, so the first time they met, um, Roman would tell him a lot about himself. So he would confess to the witness that he had been raped by his supervisor at a youth detention center uh, when Roman was only 15. Then he would tell him that he lived with his mother on, um, like in Woj, and worked in the Eskimo cotton factory or in fa cotton industry. I guess it's like defined as an industry. I just assumed it was like it was referring to a factory or I guess. Yeah, like it, it could be interpreted as either cotton industry or cotton factory. It's Polish is weird. So Roman told the witness that he was 27 years old and um, 178 centimeters tall, which is five foot eight around five foot eight uh, or five feet eight he had brownish amber eyes and dirty blonde hair with a side part and things to note about him were a little freckle or beauty mark under his left eye and on his throat he also had letters some letters tattooed on his left um hand fingers so i guess either knuckle i it wasn't like clearly clearly specified, but either knuckles or fingers. And yet all of those details and testimony did not find the suspect. So, you know, we have the description, we have this witness who knows the name. Um, I don't think either the police never revealed the, the, the guy's name, like full name from this witness, or the witness didn't tell them the last name because they didn't know. But, you know, again, all of those, those details, the, you know, the sketch, the compo composite sketch, um, the physical description, where the, the possible suspect worked, and yet, you know, they couldn't find him. And there may be an explanation why, for why the killer had never been found. Because the police suspects that the perpetrator could be dead. The witness who talked about uh, Roman was actually or actually died of AIDS several months after giving his testimony, which leads to the possibility that the killer also contracted HIV that developed into AIDS, um, resulting in Roman's death shortly after. And that would also explain why the murder spree had suddenly stopped after the last victim in 1993. So, you know, there was a murder victim in the gay community every 
once like once a year or every couple of months and yet in 1993 it just suddenly cuts off but there is also the possibility of the killer just moving away or simply stopping his crimes altogether and which would not be completely impossible there are unsolved cases out there where serial killer just ended his activity after a certain point and was either caught um, just decades later or wasn't caught at all uh, like for example like the zodiac killer you know just suddenly the the murders simply stopped um but yeah like this is i guess this is the most likely scenario if roman was the guy you know if roman was the suspect it's possible that he contracted AIDS from or contracted HIV from um, the witness that he had a sexual intercourse with and then he also died of AIDS. But uh, yeah, this case still remains unsolved, officially still remains unsolved um, because, you know, this is just a theory, this is just a speculation uh, based on the witness statement and on the fact that the witness died of AIDS. You know, it's one of the possibilities. They never found Roman. They never interviewed him. So, um, you know, who's to say that it it was actually him? It might have been compl a completely different person. It might have been more than one person. Um, but yeah, until this day, or I mean, as of today, the case remains unsolved. And I am officially dead too, because I am dying. I have to sleep. God damn. So he either died or left Poland. Hopefully he didn't start killing in another country as well. I mean, definitely there are some, you know, there was, um, I think, I believe there was a case of like gay murder. I mean, there was definitely like cases of gay uh, serial killers or just serial killers targeting gay people uh, around the world. There was a case around the same time in the UK. Um, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't really like read through it in detail, but there was apparently like another serial killer who was targeting gay men so who knows you know this is i guess this is gonna be not never gonna be answered or it's unlikely to be answered although we can still hope okay the suspect profile profile practically writes itself here yeah for sure like this is you know that's it matches like there's a lot that matches this there's, there's a lot of details that match the potential killer killer profile like roman was assaulted by a man um in his youth and he was also gay and i don't know like the, he had he possibly that had that hatred um he had some criminal i guess he had some um criminal history because he was in the youth detention center wait that's miles teller <laughs> No, I think that's a wax figure. I don't even know. Like, it looks like a wax figure. These sketches are creepy sometimes. I mean, most of the time. Okay, but thank you so, so much for tuning in today. Let me just quickly um, thank my patrons. I'm sorry, I I want to read them out, but I can't read anymore. Like, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I was kind of checking on my notes and I could barely, like, make out the details. Uh, but again, thank you guys so much for supporting my channel, for supporting my Patreon and being there for the bonus true crime streams that, um, you know, I have weekly on Patreon. Okay, let me switch back to the screen, to the chat screen. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Dale just uh, donated $20. Thank you so much. Uh, wasn't in chat as much because I was doing chores. So I'll make it up by welcoming you back to Taiwan. Great case as always. Ah, thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for the donation for, uh, you know, for your support. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm dead. Uh, magpies are dicks. This case is unsolved and, uh, I can, I can finally fall asleep now. Oh my goodness. Okay. So before I go, um, again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for chatting for, you know, so, I mean, going through this case with me and asking excellent questions. Uh, and I'm sorry that I couldn't respond, like I couldn't respond to all of them and I couldn't answer some of them um, simply because there wasn't enough information um, that I could find about the case. Um, it's not like even, you know, when I was just looking for the sources like there wasn't even much it was just like oh brief articles like i couldn't even find any official like police file like case files um like i usually try to do but 
yeah that's that's pretty much that's pretty much why i'm i'm not like very clear on some of the details like the dna testing um or you know why they didn't gather some evidence or they likely didn't gather um <laughs> r.i.p sona's brain oh yeah i mean it's yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty dead now sona is taking a train sleepy time junction <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay but tomorrow um I'm having a hangout call with um, my patrons, so Ruby and Diamond tier uh, patrons. And if we decide to do a gaming night, um, if we decide to play a game, I'm likely gonna stream it. And that's gonna be same time, 8 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And then, uh, well, I mean, depending, depending on the situation, depending on my jet lag, I will have a true crime stream bonus true crime stream on patreon on sunday around the same time so 8 p.m pacific time um and that's you know i just you know if you if you like my streams if you like the format obviously and if you want to see some more content and get access to a library of true crime streams and cases that i've covered on patreon uh you know you can go ahead and go to the description there's a link uh, you can subscribe and, uh, you know, just uh, support support my work. And at the same time, get some nice perks. Uh, which includes, yeah, like the, you know, obviously weekly true crime streams. As well as hangout calls for some tiers. Uh, monthly or bi-monthly hangout calls and events. And just uh, early access to some stuff. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, again. If you like the stream, if you like the format, just take a second to click that like button i would be very very grateful for that because it really helps it's not much but it helps the channel it helps it really helps youtube algorithm to uh you know push my content again okay that's for the last time thank you so much for tuning in stay safe out there always lock your doors and windows bury your axes do not hold them keep them in the house uh, magpies are dicks, squirrels are dicks, and I am going off to Sleepy Town. Thanks for watching. Until the next time. Bye.